Okay, before we start, who needs a review sheet for the final exam? So I handed this in a uh, back last Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so today is the last um, lab, and um, we have two more lectures, and I'm hoping that you'll have your lab notebook ready to turn in today, but if you don't, you can turn it in on Wednesday. So it needs to have all of the lab materials that we've completed, including today's lab, so that might be a reason why you might not get it turned in today. You need to take home today's lab and write it up. And then also your extra credit needs to go in your lab notebook. So I'm going to grade that when I grade the lab notebook. Okay. So how do you decide how much extra credit is for um, so um, if you um, if it's not well written and it's got some grammatical errors and you have no references, then you're not going to get full points. If it's pretty well written and it goes a little bit beyond um, what we talked about in class and you have your references, then I generally give it full points. And then sometimes it's exceptional. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I give even more points for exceptional work. Okay. But generally, you'll get the full points as long as you um, do the minimum amount of work there. Um, yeah, probably. Hi. Kelsey. Kelsey here. Roberts not here. Alyssa's not here. Veronica's not here. Okay. Okay. So last Wednesday we talked about and we watched a video about Darwin and Wallace and their ideas about how species change. So prior to that time, it was believed that species were fixed, that they did not change in response to the environment, and that they were created and they just kind of stayed the same, which would also imply that variation was not significant. But now, as with when we have the Mendelian and kind of the Darwinian kind of theories coming together, we now know that species do change, and that that variation is the source of the change, okay? So when we talk about evolution, we're going to define it as a change in a group of organisms over time. Okay, so there's different levels of this. So sometimes we talk about it in a population, and this is what we call microevolution. So this is changes within a population and it's important to realize that individuals do not evolve. So sometimes you hear that in terms of like psychology or maybe philosophy, you talk about the evolution of a thought, right? 
So in biology, we say that individuals do not evolve and they do not adapt, but they do have adaptations that have been passed down to them from subsequent generations. And so when we talk about changes within a population, we can say that some individuals are more likely to survive than others, and then that is going to change how that population looks, okay, or its physiology. So that's the microevolution. And then we can talk about macroevolution. So this it means that it is bigger groups. So this includes speciation, and we'll we're going to talk about space speciation, probably not get to that today. Um, probably on Wednesday we'll talk about speciation. So that is where like one species could become geographically isolated. You could have a mainland population. They could um, uh, migrate onto two islands. And over time they're going to adjust, they're going to evolve to their specific environmental conditions. And then if you brought them back together, they might not breed because they will have become separate species. So we'll define species. But that's speciation or even um, uh, major or other major groups of it, or other major groups. So for example, when we look at the reptiles, we believe that the reptiles gave rise to two major groups, right? So they gave rise to the birds and also the mammals. And so we believe that mammals have a reptilian ancestor. So we evolved from a reptile ancestor. And we see back in the fossil record, remember we talked about evidence for evolution, we see that at one point in time, we all we have is reptiles. And if you go back at one point in time, all we see is amphibians. And if you keep going back, maybe all we'll see is fish, and you don't see any terrestrial um, vertebrates. And then, so as we move up, um, in the geological time scale, we start to see new groups showing up in the fossil record. And so from the reptiles, after the reptiles went extinct, not all of them went extinct, but the dinosaurs, for example, went extinct, then you get this massive um, new group, um, kind of rapid, re uh, relatively rapid evolution of the major mammals. Okay. So, <clears throat> When we talk about macroevolution, sometimes we also talk about transitional fossils. So these are organisms that have characteristics of one group and another group. And so one of the most famous example of this is Archaeopteryx. And does anybody know, what is Archaeopteryx a transition between? The Archaeopteryx is actually a transition between reptiles and birds. So some of the reptilian characteristics is, is that they have teeth. They have claws at the end of the wings. Let's see, claws at end of wings. Okay. Birds, they have wings, right? And they also have feathers, which are actually modified reptilian scales. So Archaeopteryx has these characteristics, which appears to be in transition, from going from a reptile to um, a bird. And we obviously don't have these around today. So these transitional fossils went extinct, but they could have given rise to the modern day bird. So <coughs> if we look at um, an example of this fossil, this is the fossil. And remember, I mentioned that fossils are mineralized remains of animals. And so in this case, the feathers actually didn't mineralize, but they left a, um, a pattern in the rock. And then the bones here are mineralized. And so if you look at the end of the wings here, they have uh, claws. And so if we look at a representation, this was what it would look like. And so this is Archaeopteryx being a transitional fossil. Modern day birds do not have teeth. Right? But they actually have the genes that recode for teeth, but they don't have teeth. Those genes are turned off. 
Do you know how birds eat, or how do birds grind their food if they don't have teeth? Well, they don't regurgitate it, but they, well, they can regurgitate it, but they have a gizzard. And so they, sometimes birds will eat rocks and they'll actually grind their food in a special part, compartment of their digestive tract called the gizzard. So they don't chew their food, but they grind it in their digestive tract. Also, Archaeopteryx has vertebrae that goes all the length of the tail. And subsequent birds, modern day birds, have lost the vertebrae in their tail. So the tail is actually just feathers. So it doesn't actually have um, vertebrae and spinal um, nerves going down through it. So there are other, some other really interesting ones. This is a um, transitional fossil called Tiktaalik. I think that's a native word, um, Inuit word. And Tiktaalik is a transition between a fish and an amphibian. So like a bony fish and then like a salamander. And then my favorite is an example of a transitional fossil called Ambulocetus. And this cetus means whale because cetaceans are whales. And so ambulo means walking. And so this is between a terrestrial mammal and a whale. Ambulocetus. So that's the walking whale. And so one of the interesting things is that they have their nostrils on their top of the head. So they're going to start to breathe um, air and then dive down so they can evolve that blowhole. And then um, they also have kind of webbed um, toes. But remember that in the whales, those actually go away. So there's actually some other intermediate transitional uh, fossils. This is called Basilosaurus. So it has a primitive kind of leg here, but it doesn't actually, it's just the bones of the leg. It doesn't actually have a leg. And then the modern day whale, we see that they have pelvic girdle, but they don't have any hind appendages. And so these would be examples of macro evolution. And so you can understand that in some cases, in outside of biology, the micro evolution is believed to be, yeah, I can see how that would work. But outside of biology, people have problems um, philosophically and theologically, like with the religion, of thinking about uh, macroevolution. So macroevolution is more controversial outside of biology than would be microevolution. Okay. We can oftentimes see microevolution occurring um, even in bacteria or even in insects because they, for example, become resistant to the drugs that we use to kill them. And that would be an example of microevolution. Okay, so let's look at the mechanism. So this is the mechanism that um, Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace came up with. And this is the idea of natural selection. And selection here is important to realize that this is non-random. Okay. But I'm gonna put here mutations are random. So people get um, mutations and natural selection kind of confused in their mind because they think that mutations um, occur and they you mutate towards a goal. But that's not the truth. That's not, right. that's not how it works. So um, mutations are random and then we have selection for those. And so when we look at the assumptions of natural selection, that's, that's an M, assumptions. The first thing is, is that there are variations between individual. And remember that Mendel explained how variation could be maintained through the passing down of alleles from one generation um, to the next. The second thing is that, that this variation is heritable. 
So what that means is, is that if one individual has um, a longer neck, right, that variation can be passed on to his offspring. It's not something that he obtains during his lifetime and then doesn't get passed down, okay? So this variation is heritable. And so this is means that it is genetic. And then the third thing is, is that more individuals are produced than can possibly survive and reproduce. So we generally produce, and if we don't think about humans here, if we think about insects, for example, they have a mode of reproduction, which is called our select selection, where they produce a lot of offspring in hopes that just a few will actually survive to adulthood and pass the genes on to the next generation, okay? So more individuals are produced than can possibly survive, right? And <clears throat> this probably was something in terms of humans that's kind of hard because we like to think that everybody um, that um, is born is going to survive and can reproduce if they want to, right? But in the in the truest sense, that is not the case. So if you think about um, poverty, but if you also think about um, just some individuals are more unhealthy than others, and those individuals are not likely to be able to reproduce and pass their genes on. Okay, so. This is easy to see in other um, species. It's more difficult to see in humans because we've added to um, our ability to survive. We've, we've added medicine, right? So we have, you know, created um, this um, atmosphere where more people are surviving and reproducing. Okay. Okay, so that's the example of natural selection. And we are going to watch an example, which is called, or watch a video, which is called Rock Pocket Mice. And fur coloration. So if you were going to give an example, if I had you define natural selection and then give an example of it, this would be a good example to use. And we're actually going to do a little bit of um, number crunching in lab on this one, too. Okay. Is the volume turned on? These videos are by Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Across the American Southwest, golden deserts dotted by cacti and brush stretch for miles. Yet here, New Mexico's Valley of Fire, the landscape changes dramatically. Patches of black rock interrupt the sand, remnants of volcanic eruptions that occurred about 1,000 years ago. The eruption spewed a river of lava more than 40 miles long across the desert. As the molten rock cooled, it darkened, leaving any creature dependent upon camouflage in serious trouble. In the complex battle of life, one of the constant struggles between seeing and not being seen, the evolutionary game of hide and seek. And we've come here to the Valley of Fire in New Mexico, a battlefield, to find one of the tiniest soldiers and what it can teach us about how evolution works. On the desert sands, the rock pocket mouse blends in perfectly, its light colored fur concealing it from predators. On a dark lava, the same fur makes the mouse stand out, attracting the many creatures that see it as food. 
flights through the Snickers bar of the desert. They're eaten by foxes and, and coyotes and, and rattlesnakes, and certainly by owls, and maybe even occasionally hawks. And most of those predators are visual predators. So what happened to the pocket mice that found themselves on this new terrain? When I accompanied biologist Michael Nachman onto the lava, it doesn't take long to find out. Nachman has been collecting mice unharmed in traps. And it's a dark one. It is. Now, are most of the ones you find up here dark? Almost all. It's not only have the mice here evolved to be as dark as the mushrooms, the color change has occurred precisely where it will conceal them from hunters. A bit of white and belly, too. That's right. All of the dark ones here and there under a lot of those have a white under belly. Presumably, there's no selection for dark on the belly because yeah. predators are coming to the sun. Left to themselves, the mice show no preference for light or dark rocks. It's the predators that have made the difference. The change in color over evolutionary time in the population is driven by predators weeding out the mice that don't match their background. But how did the dark mice arise in the first place? When a black mouse appears in a light population of mice, that is usually going to be due to a mutation. And those are random and rare events. To fully understand the pocket mouse transformation, Nachman moves from the lava to the lab. He and his team extract DNA from light and dark mice taken from one desert region. The aim? Find one or more genetic mutations that cause dark coloration. A mutation is a change in the chemical letters that make up our genes. It's a copying error that may occur when our cells divide. Mutation seems to mean that something bad has happened. Well, mutations are neither good or bad, whether they are favored or whether they are rejected or whether they're just neutral depends upon the conditions an organism finds itself. So for the pocket mouse, a mutation that causes a mouse to turn black, that is good if you're living on black rock, it's bad if you're living out in the sandy desert. The light mice are all on the bottom here. Fur color is a trait controlled by many genes. To figure out how dark mice evolved, Nachman focuses on how these genes differ in dark and light mice. One by one, the genes prove identical, but at last, something does turn up. The difference between dark and light mice boils down to a difference of four chemical letters in a gene called MC1R. Because the gene controls the amount of dark pigment in a mouse's hair follicles, a mouse with these mutations grows dark fur, which gives it an advantage on a dark background. But still, that's one mouse. How would its dark fur spread to a whole population? This lava flow is about a thousand years old. And so you might wonder, is, has there been enough time? It's only been a thousand years. It's a very short period of time for a new mutation to come along and spread so that all of the mice on this lava flow are black, because really they all are. Indeed, such a rapid spread of a mutation may seem unlikely. Until you do the math. And the reason is that while only one new mouse born in 100,000 may be black, hundreds of thousands of mice are born in any given year. And then those mice that are black have enough advantage that their babies do better, and they have more offspring, and their offspring have more offspring. And just about a 5% advantage compounded year in and year out can very quickly turn the whole population black, as we see today. If dark color gives mice a 1% competitive advantage, and you start with 1% of the population being dark, in about 1,000 years, 95% of the mice will be dark. If instead, the dark color gives them a 10% advantage, and it only takes 100 years. Thanks to Nachman's mice, science has an example of evolution crystal clear in every detail.
what's exciting about this is that we have a system that's very simple ecologically. You have dark rocks and you have light rocks and you have dark mice and light mice. It couldn't be simpler. We know who the predators are with the selective forces. We know precisely the genetic basis of what makes the mice have an advantage or a disadvantage depending upon where they live. All the pieces are finally together. It's a perfect illustration of Darwin's process of natural selection. In fact, it's more than that. For Nachman's mice also counter a common misconception that evolution is a random process. Well, there is one random component, and that's the process of mutation. Mutations occur at random throughout our DNA. Every new organism is born with a new set of mutations. But while mutation is random, Natural selection is not. Natural selection sorts out the winners and losers. And that's really what the whole process of evolution is driven by. But if natural selection is not random, would it produce the same result under the same conditions? It does. And here's proof. Rock pocket mice collected by Nachman from other lava flows in other parts of the southwest. These are two different black mice, and they each evolved on different lava flows, and the lava flows are hundreds of miles apart. But the changes, the genetic changes that made these mice black uh, were different in each case. And what's amazing to me is how similar the black mice are. We didn't know when we started this whether we would find that there were the same genes or different genes, and, and we were really surprised to find that they were completely different genes, and yet if you look at the mice, they look almost identical. Clearly, there are different genetic ways to make a mouse dark. But once the beneficial mutations appear, natural selection, a non-random part of evolution, can, under very similar conditions, favor very similar adaptations. In effect, each of these lava flows is like rewinding the tape of life and allowing evolution to occur again and again. And in each case, we find the dark mice have evolved. The rock pocket mice show us that evolution can and does repeat itself. And why evolutionary change is never ending. As environments transform, so must the species that inhabit them, adapting and readapting in the great and complex battle of life. Okay, <clears throat> so the important things here would be that um, natural selection in this case is the non-random survival of dark mice on dark lava flows. So those mice that are dark are more likely to survive and reproduce than the lighter colored ones. So you can say that natural selection is the non-random survival and reproduction of certain individuals. And in this case, it would be dark mice on dark lava. Okay. So it's important to realize that a light mouse can't just turn dark, right? Can't just mutate and become dark. And that dark mice and light mice are not naturally drawn to backgrounds. So it's not like the dark mice are migrating to the to the to the dark background and the light mice are migrating away from it. It's just that those are the mice that survive and those are the ones that reproduce. So would this be an example of microevolution or macroevolution? What do you guys think? microevolution because it's not speciation so two mice of different colors could come together and they could produce offspring okay. and then what's really interesting was the last part because it gave us an example of what is called convergent evolution 
And the example of convergent evolution was also given in your homework when we were talking about ice fish, the very last question. And so this is the idea that two separate groups of organisms evolve similar traits independently of one another. So this means, he said, that there was different mutations on the different lava flows that actually gave the exact same phenotype. So the phenotype being the dark fur. And so this is the idea that dark coloration evolved more than once on separate lava flows. And that is convergent evolution because they did not get their dark coloration from a, the same ancestor. So it wasn't just an ancestor passing it down to the two different groups, right? But they evolved them independently. So this is actually versus another idea in evolution, which is called divergent evolution. And divergent evolution, that's a V, has another name and it's called adaptive radiation. And this is the idea where one group gives rise to many different types of other groups. And so a good example of divergent evolution was seen in the Gulf, would be, would be seen in the Galapagos finches, for example, that, he, he, that he all started out with a common ancestor and then they evolved different um, beak um, sizes and shapes, okay? So this is where you have one group giving rise to many different groups. And so this would be like in the Galapagos finches. Okay. So the Galapagos Islands, just like the volcanic lava flows, are um, new, relatively new. And so, like Hawaii, too, is relatively new. So it, um, the volcanic eruptions created the habitat. Organisms from the mainland migrated to those islands, and then they started to diverge in their structure, depending upon what they ate, for example. So that would be the difference between convergent and divergent evolution. So what was the trait that the ice fish had that they share depending upon whether they, not depending upon whether they live in the North Pole or the South Pole, what was the trait that they would share? Yes, so they had the antifreeze gene, which is a protein, and that evolved twice. So the um, genetic code that codes for those antifreeze proteins are different, but they code for the same protein. And so that's evidence of convergent evolution in the antifreeze protein in North, North Pole fish and South Pole fish, geographically isolated. Excellent. Okay. So now we can talk about types of natural selection. And so one type um, is referred to as directional. So I'll put one, there's actually three different types. So directional. And so what this means is, is that it codes, or it um, selects for, so it selects for at the extreme, at one end. So in order to understand this, we'll look at what is called a normal distribution of a trait. So this would be, on this axis, this would be the number of individuals that have a trait. And this would be variation in the trait. So we could say this is like size in horses over time. So this would be small and this would be large, okay? 
So if we look at a normal distribution, it look, normally looks like, or it looks like this, not normally, but it looks like that, okay? And if I were to read this graph, what would it tell me is, is that most of the horses would be of medium height. Very few would be small, and very few would be large. But the question is, could we select for large and get large and larger horses in the next generation, or could we select for small and get a bunch of small horses? So this, this would be, um, in evolutionary time, this would be selection for this extreme because what we see is, is that horses get bigger over time, right? So what that means is, is that you select for individuals at either extreme. And what that means is those are the individuals that are going to survive and reproduce. So if we look at horse evolution and the fossils that show us this, this is um, millions of years ago. So this is like 55 millions of years, million of years ago. And the horses were relatively small. So all horses were small. And it's believed that they were small. And when you see speckled coats like this, um, it's assumed that they lived in the forest habitat. So forest habitat tends to produce uh, uh, this because it mimics shading. And so it is a technique for camouflage. So forest animals typically are spotted like that. If you think about leopards, for example. And then as they move out onto the big plains, they tended to get larger. And so we had selection over time for an increase in size to um, decrease predation because larger horses were much more difficult for prey to or predators to take down. So if you think about like what they might have been living with, like cheetahs in their environment, even in North America, we had a North America cheetah um, chasing them down. Right? So if they're bigger, they might be better able to fight that off than a small animal. Okay. So that's a good example of directional selection, uh, selection for one extreme. Now we have another type of selection, so a second type of selection. And this type of selection is, oh, I just lost the word. It's not directional, it's stabilizing stabilizing selection. So this is actually kind of the opposite of that directional selection where you select against extremes. Okay. And so a good example of this would be human birth weight. All right, so maybe it averages about seven pounds, for example. So most babies are within a range of like five to eight pounds. If you get babies that are born that are three pounds or babies that are born are 11 or 12 pounds, that would be selected against. So this is an LBS, seven pounds, not seven, seven pounds. So um, if we look at how this would work, right, in my graph, where this is really large babies, and these are very small babies, I would select against these. And so what I'm gonna get is a less variation. So this is gonna decrease my variation. So babies are more likely to be born. Most babies are within this narrow range. And so that's why it's called stabilizing, because I've selected against the extremes, and so I've stabilized, and it's a very specific range where babies can be born. Okay. Now, you can imagine with modern procedures that this range is going to start to increase, right? Because now, when babies are born like at one and a half pounds, you can, they can survive, right? And if that is a genetic thing, then that could be passed on to their offspring. And if they're born at 11 pounds, they can survive because you can do a C-section, right? So we're not limited by our pelvic uh, um, shape anymore. 
So it used to be babies had to be pretty small in order to pass through the birth canal, or the mother would be able, the mother would die, right? And the baby would die. Um, and um, now we just take the baby out. And so what we're going to expect to see with modern medicine is that there's going to be a relax, relaxation of that stabilizing force. So that's an example of a type of selection. And I have a diagram here. This just shows infant mortality with birth weight. And so notice that babies that are born really, really small are likely to die. And then babies that are born relatively big might die as well. Okay, so selection against the two extremes. Oops. Okay, not misconceptions yet. The third type. So this one is really interesting and probably rather rare. This is what is called disruptive selection. So instead of selecting against the extremes, this is selection against the middle, the average. So this is selection against the average. Okay. And what we see here is size in male salmon. And the male salmon come in two varieties. And their size difference has to do with how much time they spend out in the ocean before coming back to mate with the females in the rivers. And so if we look at what ha has happened here, is this would be male size. And we've, we don't have any medium size. We only have small and we have large. So this is small and this is large, okay? So we have very few, you know, or maybe not at all, medium-sized males, okay? And this actually represents the different uh, breeding strategies, the reproductive strategies that these two groups of males have. And so does anybody know what this, the small male salmon are called? They have a name. They're called what? Yes. So jack salmon are small males. And they are sneaker males. So what they do is they do not compete for the females. They just watch a male and a female. And the female has to release her eggs. And the male has to put the sperm on top of it. So what they do is they dart in, they dump their sperm, and they dart away, right? So they sneak in to reproduce, right? So they don't compete for females. If they did, they wouldn't be able to get a female to pay them any attention because they are too small, okay? So regular male salmon then compete for access to females. So you can see that if you were of medium size, you wouldn't be good at competing for females, and you also would not be a good sneaker because you would be too big and cumbersome to get in there to drop your sperm and then dart off, okay? So this is disruptive because it selects against males of medium size so that we get two distinct groups of males, both small and large. Okay, excellent. I'm going to skip my misconceptions for today because I need to get to something here. Okay. So we started talking about population genetics when we were talking about sickle cell anemia. And so we were talking about allele frequencies within a population. And so what I want to talk about today is a little bit of math that will kind of make us understand how or what or when populations do change over time. And so this has to do with microevolution. So we're gonna talk about microevolution, which is a change in the allele frequency of a population over time. Okay, 
the example that we did and we saw that that sickle cell allele started out at 25% and it might have gone to 30, right? So example would be the sickle cell allele in populations where malaria is present. Now, when geneticists were studying um, populations and population genetics, they had this preconceived idea that recessive, bad recessive alleles would always decrease over time, and your dominant alleles would always increase. And that was not the case. And so there were two mathematicians that kind of chimed in, and it was not like not long ago, it was like in the 60s, 1960s, that we came up with this idea that populations will not, the allele frequency will not change unless something causes it to change. And so this is what is called the Hardy, these are the, the mathematicians, Weinberg equilibrium model. Okay, so this states that allele frequencies will not change unless something causes them to. And we'll talk about the things that will cause the allele frequency to change. But it was just kind of, it's just kind of this weird idea that automatically the dominant alleles would become more abundant, but that's not the case. They should form an equilibrium so equilibrium means same state, right? They won't change unless something happens. And what that means is, is that we can make predictions about how many individuals will have a particular trait in a population, okay? So in order to understand this model, we have to define some variables, okay? So P is the frequency of the dominant allele. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. If the dominant and the recessive alleles are the only alleles in the population, then P plus Q must always equal one, right? So if I know the frequency of the recessive allele, like if I know the frequency of if I know the frequency of Q, I can always figure out P because I can always subtract it. And frequencies are a proportion. So frequencies are always between zero and one, right? So this frequency is always going to be between zero and one. Right? Frequencies are proportions. Okay. Okay. So we can also determine the frequency of the genotypes, okay? So we can look at the frequency of my different genotypes. Okay. So if I am, if I had two dominant alleles, I'd be PP, right? That's two dominant alleles. And so this is actually P squared. So it's P times P is the proportion. So P squared is the frequency of homozygous dominant. I would times P, the frequency of P times P, and I would get P squared. Okay, does that ever make, make sense to everybody? Okay, so Q, if I am homozygous recessive, this would be Q squared. So this is the frequency of the um, homozygous recessive genotype. So the little, little. Okay, Q squared. And then in order to get the heterozygote, it would be uh, PQ, right? But there's two different ways to get that in my Punnett square, so it's times two. So this is just two PQ. And this is the frequency of the heterozygote. Okay. 
So what this means is, is that this is a math mathematical formula that equals one, because if I add up all the frequencies of the individuals in my population, it has to equal one, right? Because if this is the only possible set of genotypes that you can have, then these have to equal one, right? So this would be P squared plus two PQ, and you might have like, oh, I know this formula, if you've been in math, right? This equals one. Okay, so how would you even use this formula? One way that you could use it is, is that you could find out the number of individuals that have a recessive trait that are homozygous recessive, and you could then calculate Q, and then you could use that to calculate P, and then you could also use it to calculate your frequencies of your other um, uh, uh, genotypes, okay? So let's look at an example of this. Oops. Okay, so do you remember in lab when you took that little piece of paper and you put it on your tongue to taste it, right? So that was actually determined by a um, recessive allele. So if you're a non-taster, so remember T means that this is that you can taste the chemical and little t would be a non-taster. So if you did not taste that chemical, your genotype must have been little t, little t. Does that make sense to everybody? Is a review? Okay. So look at the frequency of non-tasters in different populations. This is kind of weird because if you look at North American Indian tribes, right? Non-tasters are 10% of the population. But if you look at um, uh, North American Europeans, they're 26, almost 27% of the population. If you look at Aboriginal, so if you go to Australia and you look at the native people there, 50% of them cannot taste. And so what this tells me is, is there's quite a bit of variation between populations. So what I want to know is what is the carrier frequency, what is the number of individuals that are heterozygous if the non-taster frequency, we're going we're gonna to round this to 27, okay? So my non-taster in North America, European, right? So we'll do North America, European, and I did the, I did the math ahead of time. My non-tasters, is 0.27% of the population. So that's 27% of the population are non-tasters, okay? So this is Q squared. So Q squared is equal to 0.27. So if I take the square root of Q, then I get Q is equal to, so if I do the square root of this, 0 0.27, right? Q is equal to 0 0.52. Okay. Did everybody follow that? How did I know it was Q squared? Because that's the homozygous recessive frequency. Okay. Then I take the square root. So that tells me that 52% of my alleles in the North American population are the non-taster alleles. Okay. So what is the taster? P would be one minus 0 0.52, because I know P and Q have to equal one, right? So P is equal to 0 0.48. So now I know P and so and Q. So what I can do is I can figure out what are the genotypes. So if I am P squared, then I would be, what would be the number of individuals in the population that would be homozygous dominant for this tasting? So they'd be big T, big T. This would be, P squared would be 0 0.23. Okay. But remember that this is a dominant allele. So also, if I'm looking at the heterozygous, it would be 2PQ. So what I would do is I would times 0.52 by 0.48 times 2, and this gives me 0 0.50.
So what that means is I can say that 50% of my population are carriers, right? That's a lot. If you look at cystic fibrosis, which is a disease that actually um, causes people to die, it is more like 21% of the um, European, North American European population has a carrier, which is pretty high, for not 21%. Oh, must be smaller than that. This is high, right? Because this is not something that's going to be selected for or against. It doesn't cause you to die if you don't have it. Okay. So then I know um, all of the different genotypes in the population just by using that formula. And this should not change. These frequencies should not change unless something happens to cause them to change. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about are mechanisms of microevolution. Okay. So what causes your allele frequencies to change? One that we've already talked about is natural selection. Okay. A subset of natural selection is called sexual selection. That can be oftentimes be part of natural selection because it just determines how an individual um, can reproduce, right? So sexual selection is really interesting because it oftentimes produces traits that are counter to reproduction. So these are adaptations that may decrease the ability of an organism to survive. while increasing the ability of them to reproduce. So in most animals, females are a limiting resource. They're a limited resource because they're the ones that have to put more energy into the offspring. And so most of the time with sexual selection, we see male-male competition. So anything that might make the males better able to compete for access to the females would be an adaptation um, made by sexual selection. So a good example of this would be antlers. So antlers do not make sense from a survival point of view at all because they shed them every year. Think about how much energy it would take to grow all of that new bone and all of that new tissue every single year, right? And so once they go into the, um, the fall ruts, if it's in the, in the fall where they're mating, they oftentimes spend a lot of time fighting with one another, right? And they don't spend a lot of time eating. And then they have these huge, energetically expensive weaponry on the top of their head. And that can cause them sometimes to get stuck in fences or stuck in trees, you know? And so all of that would make it counterintuitive to survival that antler size is correlated with the ability to reproduce, right? Because the bigger the male, the bigger the antlers, the more likely they're going to get a harem of females, be able to protect their females and to mate with their females and pass their gene on to the next generation. So that would be a good example of um, something that is um, selected for via sexual selection. We also have female choice. So sometimes the males are not. Um, competing directly with each other, but rather they're competing for female attention. And so this would be like um, bright coloration or bright plumage in male birds. So if you think about 
um, even male blackbirds, the female is just this dull brown, right? She blends in perfectly in the environment. You can't even see her because she's so well blended in with the cattails and the grasses and where they live, right? And then the male is black, and then he's got these bright red um, epaulets or epaulets, epaulets on his shoulders, and he, you know, makes his wings really big, and he sings a really loud song, right? All of that is to attract females, and also to actually also to create a territory by which other males don't come in. So the females they look at the male, but they also look at how good his territory is for laying and nesting. Um, and laying her eggs. And so that would be an example of female choice that has caused this bright plumage in male birds. Okay. So in male birds, oftentimes you see something like this. I, I think this is the widow bird, but I'm not sure. This is a male, right? They tend to also have very long tails, right? All that difference in plumage coloration is simply an, uh, due to their ability to reproduce. That is a trait that the females selected for, and so the males that have it are the ones that get to reproduce, okay? And then again, the antlers, these are, these are not, these are elk or something, reindeer maybe, elk. So these would be male-male um, competition. Okay. So that was selection, and so selection is non-random. Is, is non -random. Genetic drift, think drift, think random. So genetic drift is random, and there are some mechanisms for it. So for example, if you have, um, a good example of this is if you have a natural disaster, that randomly kills off 90% of the population, the probability that that 10% that is remaining is gonna have the exact same allele frequency as the original population is very, very rare, right? It's, it's real, a real low probability. So if the natural disaster just wipes out 90% of the population, the 10% that survive are, do not survive because of their variation. They just survive by chance, right? So the 10% just survived by chance. Okay. The similar, a similar thing can happen when we over-harvest. So if we are over-harvesting um, animals, oftentimes we're not selecting them based upon their traits. So we do have hunting regulations where we try to say only pick the big fish, right, or harvesting. Oh, don't, you know, the little fish have to throw back, right? But if you're over harvesting and you're, and you're killing off a large number of the population, then that tends to be an example of genetic drift as well. And that um, can lead to what is called the bottleneck effect. Okay. So this is where you start out with a large population. So let's say that we had like 10,000 individuals in this population. And then we went down to 100 individuals. Right? There's my bottleneck. For some reason, the population was reduced dramatically. And then those 100 are going to give rise to the next population, and it could go back to 10,000, right? So if P is 0 0.5 and Q is 0 0.5 here, right? P on the other side could be 0 0.8 and Q could be 0 0.2. Okay. So what has happened is just through the bottleneck effect, just because 100 randomly survived, the generation that they give rise to, the allele frequency is going to be dramatically different. And so this is what happens oftentimes when um, we reduce populations down really quickly due to um, over-harvesting. So if I give you some examples, there's some 
historical data about different animals. Okay. So for example, the Northern elephant seal um, um, went down to 30 individuals in 1890. And today there are thousands, but they were derived from those that founding population of 30 individuals. The golden hamster in the 1930s, a single litter. Those were all brothers and sisters, right? So all those brothers and sisters interbred, right? And now there's millions of them. The American bison went in 1890 went down to 750, right? There were billions of them because of overkilling. And today there's about 360,000, right? The European bison, um, they went down to 12 individuals, and now there's 3,000 of them. Okay? So conservation genetics is really important um, in understanding this because we want to increase, or in some way, help to increase the genetic variation that we see in endangered populations. Okay, I'm going to stop there for today, and then we'll finish up on this chapter on Wednesday, and I will see you today in lab, a few minutes.